Here we are for chapter 4.5, last one in the chapter. We're going to look at factors affecting biodiversity today. Biodiversity. <laughs> what causes it? What causes it to increase? What causes it to decrease, etc. One of the first things we're going to look at is speciation. The creation of species, if you will. There are a lot of species on the planet. Where did they come from? How did they get here? We know some species go extinct. Uh, it's not like we, the Earth started with this many species and it's slowly been decreasing and eventually there'll be one left. No, we have new species appearing, some species dying off. Let's take a look at some of these factors. First off, for a new species to come into existence, normally this is going to happen in two distinct phases. The first is isolation. So let's take a mouse. Okay, we have some sort of creature which is mouse-like. And they're on a ship. The ship goes down and some mice head off to this island and some head off to this island. Well, on one island, there's really no predators and there's a fairly good abundance of food on the island. The other island has a lot of predators, hawks, owls, etc. and it's kind of a rocky, crevicey area. Well, the organisms over here, which are kind of big and strong, do well because they can gather food and they can fight off each other to get to the food. So the bigger, stronger ones survive longer, better, reproduce, and after several generations of mice, not really just several, but after, you know, 10, 15 years of this process, what I find over there are very large rodents. Now, they have been isolated from this group. They started off from the same type of mice, genetically similar, that they could interbreed. After 20 years of the mice breeding on that island, I tend to have pretty large rat-like looking creatures. However, on this island, where it was beneficial to be small, to be able to get in the crevices away from the predators, the larger mice that couldn't get away, they wound up getting killed off. So in time, I come back and I visit this island and this island, what I find are large, slow, rat-like creatures, and I find really small, nimble, mice-like creatures, maybe even smaller than the original that's there. And in time, this species cannot even breed with this species anymore because of all of the minor changes in their genome. So we have to have geographic isolation. Now, there's a lot of reasons that could happen. In this case, I had a shipwreck, and some went this way, some went that way. It could be that a population migrated. Certain birds flew and they went to this area, and they didn't go back to where the others were. Maybe they get carried downstream by a river or something and wind up in a new location. Maybe a huge storm blows some insects off course, etc. Uh, it can be a lot of other things and can be natural causes. An uh, earthquake can happen, a volcano eruption, and the lava flow separates one from another. But there has to be some sort of isolation. Then it's reproductive isolation. Now, once again, these my, mice over here couldn't breed, they couldn't make the swim across. So they tended to have mice sex with the mice here, and they tended to have mice sex with the mice sex here. Like I talk about, people in Florida, if they're going to have sex, who do they have sex with? By and large, people in Florida. Sure, they could get on a plane and fly to Manhattan, but for the most part, people in Florida tend to be interbreeding with people in Florida. And people in Kansas tend to be interbreeding with people in Kansas. That's what we're talking about. The rats over here are typically breeding with each other. The mice over here are breeding with each other for a long period of time. There is reproductive isolation. They are not reproducing, so the genes are not mixing. So. Now, mutation and change is going to occur. We keep trading with the same type of gene pole, but with UV radiation, a possible chemicals on the island, mutation occurs. Uh, the DNA is hit, the DNA breaks apart, and when it reforms, I get a small mutation. And these mutations get passed on. So over hundreds and hundreds of reproductive pairs 
little tiny mutations make it into the gene pool. Now, if they were sexually reproducing, that would get with everybody, but it's not. So I get little tiny differences here, little tiny differences here, and in time, they can no longer mate and produce a fertile offspring. So this reproductive isolation along with geographic isolation tends to lead to the creation of a new species. The one we're going to look up up here is the Arctic fox. Once again, this is one that's in the book, so you have a chance to read about it. We'll highlight it here real quickly, but there are many different examples. So the early fox population came across from Europe, crossed over like the land bridge. Some of them stayed up in the northern areas and some migrated down to the south. So we now currently have the gray fox. It's a little taller, has shorter fur, larger ears. The larger ears and longer legs allow for heat to escape. But in the Arctic fox, shorter legs, shorter ears, thicker fur allow it to adapt to the northern climate. The change in its ecosystems, the adaption over time, whatever was best adapted to the environment it lived in, survived, had sex more often, had more babies than the one that died earlier, and it, that gene gets passed on. So in time, most of the foxes in the north tend to have white fur to blend in, thicker fur to keep warm, shorter ears, shorter legs. And eventually we have two distinct species of fox. Once again, can happen with many different organisms and does. Now let's look at some of these geological processes that can affect this biodiversity. Once again, all of these can lead to isolation. Geographic isolation can lead, does not always, but can lead to speciation, a new species. Tectonic plates, they obviously affect evolution, distribution of life on Earth. The tectonic plates cause earthquakes, can cause separation, the volcanoes come from that. The entire plates move apart or slam into each other over millions and millions of years. So, the locations of our continents and the oceans themselves have shifted. Speciation happens in fish, aquatic animals, as well as terrestrial. Species, because of the shifting in the plates, move and they have to adapt to their new environments. They may migrate, the environment starts to get bad and they may leave, go somewhere else that's more favorable. Or the plate may shift and forces them separate from this area. They can't get across the gulf, whatever it is. Maybe it's an ocean, maybe it's just a huge chasm. Maybe a large sinkhole opens and the animals at the bottom can't get out to mingle with the animals at the top anymore. Some sort of isolation. All of these things happen. Also, just like volcanoes or earthquakes, they can destroy habitats. And if a habitat gets destroyed, then something could wind up going extinct or once again, it can shut things off one from another. That's like we looked at and you've talked about before in some of your classes, Pangea. Some 225 million years ago, we believe all of the continents were virtually jammed all together in one large supercontinent. Well, and then the tectonic forces ripped and pulled them apart into our present day situation. Well, obviously animals had the opportunity to go back and forth, but Africa got separated from North America and South America and things that were on one or the other when they broke apart became isolated and they no longer come into contact with each other. It's not hard to imagine an organism that was a proto-lion, if you will, that it may have lived on Pangaea, but when they separated out, one, as it lived in the savanna, became the lion as we know it, sandy colored, living in the savanna, and another organism became a tiger living in the jungles with the orange and stripes. Very similar large cats, but currently today, they cannot interbreed and produce a fertile offspring. Yes, you can cross a lion and a tiger and you can get a liger, but the liger is sterile. It cannot reproduce on its own. They're still very similar, but different species. One way that it can happen. 
Another way that species uh, can be created is very new, if you will, but this is through either artificial selection, which isn't too new, but it's new with, the, with humans, then genetic engineering, gene editing, and synthetic biology. And we're kind of getting from new with humans to really new as in right now with synthetic biology. So let's go back and take a look. I talked about artificial selection before and we talked about evolution with Charles Darwin and his pigeons. I've talked about it with dogs and that's cr classically it. Artificial selection is just cross breeding. This is where I take two organisms and I breed them together to get their offspring and then I get enough of that offspring and I breed the offspring together and now I have Doberman pinchers. Yes, I realize dog is one species, but you get the idea. Dogs all originally came from wolves or dingoes. Well, my little dog, who you've probably seen wander around in here from time to time, doesn't look anything like a wolf. Uh, slightly dingo-ish, but, uh, you know, from poodles to chihuahuas to German shepherds to Doberman pinchers to Jack Russell terriers, much variety. And this has been done by artificial selection. We took a wolf that had characteristics I like, slightly curly hair, and I bred the slightly curly, it did like a very curly hair dog. I took two wolves that seemed to be sort of calmer than the others, and I bred them. And I kept getting the calmest wolves I could find and bred them until I got a more docile animal, our dog, per se. Selective breeding or cross breeding. It has to happen between genetically similar species. We do this, uh, it's not really a form of speciation, but it's this beginning trade of it. It's something that humans are doing. But it is a very slow process. I have to put two things together, have them breed in some way. Now, if it's flowers, I can do that myself. I can cross-pollinate them myself. If it's animals, I put them together, allow them to copulate. Then they have the next offspring, the next offspring, the next offspring. It's a slow process. It's dependent on the reproduction rate of whatever the organism is. And this is how we've gotten most of our foods that we eat today. Rice, corn, wheat, soybeans. These have been artificially selected over years and years and years to have the varieties that we have today. Then we go into genetic engineering. Genetic engineering is basically a way to drastically speed up the artificial selection process. Instead of me taking two dogs and having them have another puppy and taking that puppy and crossing it with another dog until I get a dog that I want or I'm after, genetic engineering allows me just to splice the genes from one organism directly into another and get those traits immediately. If we do it in the egg, then when that organism is born, it has that in different ways. And also with gene editing. Genetic engineering is designing exactly like what that organism is going to be. Gene editing is where we literally do that. We edit out or we edit a specific gene so that it has a particular trait that we want. Now, Let's go through the steps in genetic engineering. Now, once again, this is a overview. This is something in biology. If you want to go into, there's a lot more steps, a lot more detail, but this covers the basics of what we're doing. We identify a gene with the desired trait. Let's say we want corn plants to be able to deal with more salt in the soil because we live near the ocean and sometimes, you know, we get salt water from the river washes into it and normally corn doesn't do well in salty environments. So we find a plant like the mangrove that does live in salty environments. And we take out that gene that allows it to adapt and then we uh, want to put that into our corn. So we extract the DNA molecule from a bacterial cell. This is the plasmid. So we expect, extract a small DNA molecule, the plasmid, from a bacteria. Why bacteria? They reproduce so quickly. So we take this uh, small plasmid, we insert the desired gene, this ability to tolerate salt, into the plasma, 
and this forms what we call recumbent DNA. So now I have a recumbent DNA plasmid that was in that bacteria. Now we insert it into the cell of another bacterium. Once again, I just have that plasma. Now we put it into a bacteria that will divide and reproduce. Remember, bacteria divide by mitosis. One bacteria becomes two, two become four, four become eight. 8, 16, 32, 64, you get the idea. So we put it in the bacteria, the, ba the bacteria begins to reproduce and produces large numbers of cells with that desired trait. Now we will take the genetically modified bacteria cell and put that into the plant or animal and now it has been genetically modified. So this is the end result is a GMO, a genetically modified organism. We take a trait out we want, put it in a plasmid, make a plasmid DNA recumbent cell. We place that into a bacteria. We allow the bacteria to reproduce. So I have a whole bunch of them. And now I take that modified bacterial cell into the corn, if that's what my end goal was. And now I have a genetically modified corn plant that can tolerate higher levels of salt. It is a much quicker way, instead of me just breeding corn and putting in salt, the ones that maybe survive, crossbreeding them and them, eventually I could get the same result by artificial selection, but it might take me years and years where I can do it in months, or it might even take me decades, but I can do it in a matter of months with genetically modified. Quicker way to get the same result. A uh, picture that we look up here is the idea of doing it not to get salt resistant corn, but I want a pear with red color. So I can cross pollinate a pear with an apple, very similar organisms, and then I kind of get these multiple different types of fruit. Some that look just much more like a yellow apple and it took, the pear took on the yellow color. I get some kind of funny looking pears, but I take the one that looks the most like I want, crossbreed it again. Now they're showing it happens in two instances. It may not be two. If I'm crossbreeding, I may have to do this two, three, four times, but eventually I get this sort of red colored pear that's actually pear shaped, but it's a slow process of breeding and crossbreeding and crossbreeding and breeding and crossbreeding to get there. A GMO, a genetically modified, or um, using the editing, gene editing, is just a much quicker process to get very similar results. Okay. This is how species can develop. Isolation, reproductive isolation, that's how nature is taking care of it, and then new species come into existence. And humans have been doing it, utilizing artificial selection, and more recently, um, gene editing or gene splicing. Now, let's see what happens on the other end of the spectrum. Species leaving the planet. Extinction events. Okay, extinction, very simply, is just a process where an entire species ceases to exist. I've mentioned the white rhino before. The last male white rhino died uh, last year, sometime in 2019, I believe. It may have been early 2020. Around 2019, the last male white rhino died. There were two females left, at least as of filming this. But once they die, the species is gone. So the entire species ceases to exist. Now, we may have an endemic species. An endemic species is a species that lives only in one little area, like we only find them in the rainforest of here, or we only find them at the bottom of this particular sinkhole. Uh, we, they have to be in one particular area, this one little habitat. It's not like we find them in deserts all over the world. We only find this organism in the Nevada desert in this county or something. So an endemic species is a species that lives in one very specific area, nowhere else. Some of our salamanders up in the Appalachians are this way. They only live up in the Appalachians when we find them in kind of certain stream things. So if the ecosystems change, they would be in danger of extinction. Since they're only in one little area, they're particularly vulnerable to extinction because if something changes in that area, habitat loss, you name it, they're gone. 
And we also want to talk about background extinction. Now, extinctions have been going on all the time. And background extinction is when we look at so how many species are usually going extinct a year. And that number tends to be about 0.0001%. Or if we had 10 million species on the planet, which is kind of what we think, well then about one species a year would be going extinct. Sorry, 10. 10 species a year would be going extinct. This is a normal rate of extinction. So if about 10 organisms are going extinct a year, that's just about the planetary average. Now, some species are coming into existence and some species are getting extinct. Uh, and it's just this kind of balance which creates our biodiversity. Now, normally when we talk about extinction, our mind always jumps to mass extinction events. So let's identify. Just background extinction, this is just the normal process. Things do die out. Systems change the area where they live, whether it's climate change, human-made, natural, uh, tectonic events, geological events, change something, a habitat gets destroyed, forest fire burns it out, extinction. Uh, they're normal. The mass extinction, or what our minds tend to jump to, ooh, the dinosaurs all died out. Yes. This is a significant rise above the background level. Uh, we're talking somewhere between 30 to up to 90% of species become extinct in a short period of time. Now, a short period of time might be 100 years, but in a reasonably short period of time, we get a significant jump above the background. So we go, ooh, whoa what happened or what is happening in the case. The causes are actually unknown. We believe that giant volcanic eruptions, and especially multiple eruptions at the same time, throw enough ash, block out the sun, plants can't grow, animals die out. The collision with asteroids or meteors, we're pretty sure the one in the uh, Cretaceous was an asteroid or meteor. A lot of evidence points to that, but we're not 100% sure why. Most of these happen so far in our past, very difficult to piece together the exact reason. But whenever there is a mass extinction event, it provides the opportunity for the evolution of a new species. Change over time, and one species may break off and become two as they rise to the new occasion. Now up here, this kind of green to blue chart, it's in the book as well. I don't know how well you can see it here. This is our extinction events that we've been able to track or trace. So you'll see down at the blue, it kind of starts and it grows in this wedge and then it shuts off. Well, that shut off is the extinction event. The wedge is trying to show how many species we think there were and went off. So down at the very bottom of this thing, you'll notice the wedge is not very wide compared to modern green up here as new species emerge. So if we go all the way down to the bottom, that first mass extinction event was in the Ordovician era. And we think about 50% died off. This was 500 million years ago. Now, the planet's some 4 billion years old, so there's a bunch of past we just can't really work out. But at some 500 million years ago, during the Ordovician era, about 50% of known species died off for whatever process. And then slowly, speciation occurs. The population, if you will, number of species increases all the way up to the Devonian period. And this was around 345 million years ago, and about 30% died off. It went, it's not quite as far short of the wedge, but there weren't as many species uh, at the Ordovician. So, then we come up to the Permian. Now at the Permian event, uh, this one, we think about 90% of the known species died off at that time. So huge event, whether this is you know, tectonic plate movement, 
volcano eruptions possibly because of it, and a lot of these there might be multiple events. A huge tectonic shift, lots of volcanoes go off, cloud dust up in the sky, maybe a meteor hit and even cause some, who knows, unknown, but about 90% are gone. Then the Triassic was about 180 million years ago, about 35% of all known species disappeared from the planet. Once again, not overnight, but in a short period of time. Over a period of 50, 100 years, all of a sudden, many species, we find no evidence in the fossil record ever again. Then we come up to the Cretaceous. This was 65 million years ago. This is a classic one with the dinosaurs, etc. And about 80% died off 65 million years ago. And the very top of this thing is current. Right now, a lot more species than the typical background. Remember, 200 species of frog alone have become extinct since 1970. That's only 50 years, so we're looking at four a year only in frog numbers, well above background. Now, we're not up to 35, 80%, etc. But we may be looking at an extinction event currently right now that, you know, 50 million years from now, other people point to. Who knows? But these are just some of the extinctions that eliminated species. In the book, it goes into a case study of the monarch butterfly. Cover picture of our book, but the monarch butterfly. Most of them have seen them. Many of you may even have butterfly gardens at your house or plants at your house. It's a pretty common practice. But the monarch butterfly migrates some 3,200 kilometers to 4,800 kilometers from northern uh, Canada and the United States all the way down to Mexico. Depending on where the butterflies got to, some 1,000 mile to 2,000 mile trek, 3,000 to almost 5,000 kilometers away. And at a certain time, they begin to migrate back to this small tropical forest in central Mexico. And they all tend to arrive back within just a couple of days of each other. So obviously ones in Canada start earlier, but anyway, they make their way back. Um, there's a second population of them that migrates to California from the Midwest. So the main population is down in Mexico and they migrate up mainly through the north. We do get them over here in Florida as well. There's another area that goes into Canada, I mean in California, and it migrates towards the Midwest. So what we see are usually more often the ones that migrate to California. Anyway, just pointing out there are two sort of distinct migration groups. Now these migrations are facing serious threats because anything from bad weather to predators to using herbicides and pesticides on humans. There's a lot of different reasons. First off, the monarch butterfly is dependent on the milkweed plant. The milkweed is just that. It's a weed and it's one of those, if you break it, little white milk tends to come out. I remember playing with it as a kid. I thought it was kind of cool to see the white stuff leaking out. But the monarchs are dependent on them to lay their eggs and the larvae eat the milkweed plant as the butterfly grows. Monarchs play a very important pollination role. As they migrate, especially for corn, they land on the little flowers and they pollinate, just like a bee. Bees are not the only pollinators on the planet. Many insects, some birds and bats are actually all pollinators. But their large migration pattern winds up being pretty important to the cycle of pollination. Now, since 1975, the overall population of them has dropped by as many as a billion. Now, they measure this by going into Can uh, Canada, measure this by going into Mexico and seeing the area of trees that the monarch butterflies are on. They try and count how many are in a certain area and then they're extrapolating. But this area has been shrinking because there are not as many monarchs to fill up the area. Since 1996, the numbers that are migrating to Mexico has dropped by more than 90%. So since 96, not that long. We're only talking about 24 years 
we've seen a 90% reduction in the monarch butterflies migrating back to Mexico. And there's a lot of reasons. Some of it is just plain old bad weather, storm. There was a uh, winter storm in one of the years up in uh, northern uh, Canada that killed off a lot of them. That's just normal nature stuff. However, there are some other things we can look at that humans are definitely causing or involved with. There's a steady loss of forest habitat in Mexico. A lot of the, there's a lot of logging going on in the area where the monarchs are. And unfortunately, a lot of that logging is illegal. People aren't supposed to go take it, but they do. And if nobody stops them, uh, you know, it's kind of like free lumber, if you will. But there is a steady loss of habitat happening in um, Mexico. There's a steady loss of habitat up through California because they kind of come up along that coastline and that's where we're developing it. So we're cutting down the natural milkweed and the forest and the logging area to put in homes. And they're not as friendly to the butterfly populations. Also, putting in farms. The prairie area, the grasslands, where there used to be lots and lots of milkweed, well, we put in corn. When we put in corn, we get rid of all the weeds. There's only a little few places that they can grow or maybe along the edge of the roads. So there's a lot of habitat loss of the milkweed, which the monarchs are dependent on. Once again, just out of the huge growth of croplands. And then we're using herbicides to kill the weeds, if at all possible. And we believe the herbicides themselves are actually causing harm to the monarch butterflies. It's just one of a species, something that we're familiar with, but we're looking at, it needs to be on the threatened. It may not be endangered yet, but the population is seriously dwindling, and some of it is definitively on us, our fault. Now, let's go ahead and kind of wrap this chapter up. We covered a lot of things, so very simply we'll hit on them. Species, play a whole bunch of variety of roles. They fill particular niches within the ecosystems. Now our biodiversity is really a balance between speciation and extinction, creation of new species and some species going extinct. There's always this natural turnover. Ecosystems are examples of those three scientific principles that we've talked about since chapter one, solar energy, chemical cycling, and biodiversity. We see all of that in the ecosystems around us. And disruptions in the degradation of species populations and their ecosystems are just ongoing and a big part of this whole aspect. So when we look at this as talking about maybe some of these amphibians, the sustainability of our planet, etc. We want to look at all of these things, some of the species playing a particular role, whether they're keystone species, whether they're indicator species, lots of things we need to look at, think about, and plan for our future. Well, that's it for chapter four, guys. Take care. We'll see you next time.